My name is Natasha Caney. I live in London, but I was not born here. This is my story. My mother is a Cape Malay colored. Her grandmother was brought to South Africa as a slave from Java by the Dutch East India Company. As my mum was mixed race and my father white, it was really difficult for them to be with each other in South Africa under the Immorality Act and Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act. The act forbade sexual relations and marriage between white people and people of so-called other races. Flouting this act would lead to incarceration if you were reported. Mr. Prinslow, what is the basic philosophy underlying apartheid as a way of life? We Europeans who have lived in this country for more than 300 years have come to a conclusion which is strange to some people in the Western world, namely that the peoples of Africa have a beautiful civilization of their own which is worth preserving. After my older brother was born, they decided they would be better off living in Germany because of the constant fear of discovery and because people tried to blackmail my mom, asking for money in exchange for their silence over my parents' relationship. They moved to a small German town called Rheinfelden, close to the Swiss border where the rest of my father's family live. I was born in Germany in 1983. My parents divorced when I was four and my mom felt increasingly homesick. Plus, after the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, my mother found the atmosphere in Germany hostile to foreigners. So my brother, my mom and I moved to Johannesburg, South Africa, while my dad remained in Germany. We initially lived in a coloured area called Nukle, which was close to my mother's family. I didn't enjoy living in Johannesburg at first. I could not speak English or Afrikaans and found it difficult to communicate with my family. Nukle was quite a dangerous area too. At night we often fell asleep to the sound of gunshots. My South African family used to live in a much nicer area called Albertsville, but were forcibly removed under the Groups Area Act, which meant you could only live in areas with people of the same race. In South Africa, people were classified as white, black, colored or Indian. Some members of my family were fairer than others and were therefore classified as white and had to live in white areas, whereas others were classified as colored and had to live in areas for colored people. My whole family was split up because of this. I've heard that in the South Africa of today, you can be classified as colored simply by looking colored. Is this in point of fact true? Well, I can give you a quote uh, which may seem amusing, but all the humiliating incidents that occurred in our country when the Department of, uh, of Census started reclassifying people. And some of the tests applied to tell a man that he was not colored was trying to pass a comb through his hair and the comb stuck, he was told you're a kaffir. Um, other people whose noses were a bit flat were told uh, you're not a coloured. If you weren't white, you were treated like cattle. In 1983, on her way home from work, my grandmother was driven over by a drunk white police officer and killed. My mother's family received 10 rand in compensation, which is approximately one pound. You said you might hesitate to rush forward to help an African injured on the street. Is that the essence of what you said, you recall it? Oh, yes. Yes, that was quoted in that book, Drum, by Anthony Sampson. And I think I, I think it was 1948. I think I've got a bit better since then. But, I, <laughs> but the point I was really trying to make was that in this kind of uh, race-mad world in which we live, that a white man, even if he went to the assistance, might well hesitate for it did. I think that, that might, you might find that in many parts of, South, of the southern states too. At school aged 11, I was asked how I should be racially classified. I'd never been asked before. I never had to explain or consider what I am. Most schools at this time were still segregated. Our school would take some black, colored and Indian pupils because it was a German international school doing its anti-apartheid bit. The gap between black and white, rich and poor, was shocking. To Prinslow, as you are no doubt aware, most criticism of apartheid outside the Union is based largely on moral grounds. For example, the morality of separate residential areas in the cities of the Union, past laws, lack of voting rights, and so on. How would you reply to this? As far as residential areas are concerned, 
the practical situation is that until about 10 years ago, there were no residential areas for urban Bantu people. It is only in the last few years that such areas were set aside on a planned basis and developed at a terrific pace, as you can see all around you. Many of my white school friends lived in huge houses with swimming pools, tennis courts and several bedrooms and bathrooms, while in the black townships people lived in shacks which were crudely put together from metal sheets, and they had to get their water for washing, cooking and so on from communal taps. The Indian and coloured areas were better in terms of housing. The houses were made of brick, people had their own bathrooms and some even swimming pools. What has not changed even today is that many Indian, white and coloured people employ black people as domestic servants and nannies paying them a minimum wage. Admittedly as a child I thought it was great that somebody else had to clean up the mess in my room. I consider myself lucky to have been in South Africa to witness the end of apartheid. After 27 years in South African jails, Nelson Mandela is a free man. At 2.15 today, our time, he walked from the gates of Victor Vester prison, hand in hand with his wife, Winnie. In 1994, when Nelson Mandela became president, my family and I were glued to the TV, and people in our area celebrated until all hours of the morning. There is considerable disappointment today though, as black unemployment is so huge and whites still somehow think they own the place and in terms of big business, they do. When I was 16 years old, I started seeing my first boyfriend who was white. Despite it being several years after apartheid and we were all living in what we called the New South Africa or the Rainbow Nation, my boyfriend and I were often harassed for being together. When I was 19, I decided to spend a gap year in England. Before I left Britain, I did get one decent job with a market research company. It was very sociable and we often went to play soccer in the park and spent evenings in the pub together. Back in South Africa in 2003, I started my first year at Rhodes University in Grahamstown in the Eastern Cape province. I studied journalism, psychology, English language and literature and I wanted to become a journalist. Compared with London, university was a really political place. Watching the coverage of the Iraq war, I became completely disillusioned with journalism. The so-called embedded journalists reporting from Iraq all seemed one-sided. During my holidays, I often visited my brother in Cape Town, which was much more happening than Grahamstown. With the beach and beautiful Table Mountain close by, I decided to transfer to the university here. I no longer wanted to be a journalist and switched to media studies. After graduating, I continued doing some psychology courses while I worked as a sales rep. In 2007, I decided to move back to London I enrolled at a British university to do a diploma in psychology. I realized, however, that I was quite judgmental and impatient and therefore would probably not be a good clinical psychologist. Compared to the very real problems I had seen people suffer in Kailicha, South Africa's biggest township, where I had done a voluntary stint, I felt I was listening to the worried well. I'm working in administration at a local college in London now. The attitudes of the 16 to 18 year olds amaze me. They often don't turn up for college, yet still expect to be paid an EMA, an Educational Maintenance Allowance. Township citizens in South Africa would give their right arm for an education and not have to be bribed. There is a culture of entitlement here and it doesn't sit right with me. I've thought about my future and realized that I really want to work either in film or TV. I joined Worldwide to learn more about documentary making and I'm currently working on a documentary about CLR James. But as the film industry is not so big in the UK, I'm currently trying to emigrate to the USA. Generally, I just feel that because I'm somebody that comes from a lot of different backgrounds, I mean I've got Scottish, Mauritian, Javan, German, I think I should be allowed to live wherever I want to live, to go wherever I want to go. I shouldn't be stopped by my passport. And I feel that it's terrible that for certain people, just because they're born in a certain place, 
other people restrict their movement and don't allow them to go anywhere else and improve their lives. There's still a kind of global apartheid, which means the rich can live wherever they want to and the poor can never move on. Open borders for me means freedom to be whatever you want to be and to live wherever you want to, to not be classified or stuck.